Okay, welcome once again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. I could use some white lightning on my brain or maybe just some jumper cables. I had to take a lot of uh, muscle relaxers yesterday, so I'm still kind of groggy. Mm. Well, we wanted to continue our uh, guilt and shame talk uh, in, in kind of... Uh, discuss cultural and and biological triggers for some of this stuff and i think heath had some continuing thoughts uh, from our last conversation and i thought that conversation yeah. was really good so i think it's a good place to uh to pick up and then if we have some time at the end uh i'll separate it out uh, but we'll do a wheel of time section as well yeah <clears throat> well i my first thought, what I thought of immediately when you texted me a while back on this thought of guilt and shame is uh, my brain went somewhere completely different. And that was our our first talk. We were talking about the chatting with Candace episode mm -hmm. um, where we got into polyamory and stuff. And there was a disconnect there when we were talking. And I think it was because we were talking about shame. But really what I was or what I think you were meaning was guilt. And so that's where my brain went was the difference between shame and guilt in that context. Well, now that we discuss, discuss the differences between them, yeah. that makes our disconnect much more clear. Yes. And it, it, it might've been a, we should have talked about that first. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you, I was talking about how shame can be good and you were saying that if you make these mistakes or do these things that you later regret in life, you shouldn't regret them or you shouldn't be ashamed of, of them. But I, I think more you shouldn't feel guilty about them. And I think that's where where people can get into really bad negative mental space is when you feel guilty for something that you should only feel shame for that. Well, let, let, let me let me review the difference between the two, just in case someone didn't watch that episode. OK, uh, the difference between guilt and shame is uh, shame is extrinsic, which means it comes from the outside. in. so it's 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 how you're viewed by society and your awareness of that. Uh, whereas guilt comes from the inside out. It is it is knowing in, inside that you have done something improper or wrong. And they both have uh, usefulness as a species because we are a social species. So obviously things that tend to be shamed, I'm going to use the word tend because this is where we would get in a disagreement yeah. of what should be uh, and what are the markers of that. But uh, <clears throat> for, the, for the, the sake of, of just kind of a, a starting point where we're both on the same page, they tend to be things that socially acceptable things tend to be things that are good for society. Uh, and they they also and and then things that we feel guilty about tend to be things that make us more pro-social so you know you look at someone who is like a sociopath they feel no guilt uh and they're aware of shame uh so they'll, they, they they blend in because they're aware of the shame but they feel no guilt so they still do bad things uh so that's the difference between guilt and shame. One comes from the inside out, the knowledge that you are doing wrong versus the outside in society telling you that you're doing wrong. And, uh, and, and I'll add the element of making sure everybody else knows you're doing wrong. So you suffer the consequences to get back in line. And again, sometimes they, they run along the same line and sometimes they don't. I, I also think that, um, Guilt is, a, is something that's a lot stronger um, because In some people per our last discussion, just definitionally, mm -hmm. because guilt has a has a connotation of something that's more definitive, more objective, whereas shame is based on cultural standards. So what is um, uh, modesty, for instance? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, w w what is an acceptable amount of skin to show in Walden culture in one context? Yeah, we don't know, want we... to go down my road, my whole day. <laughs> and then, you know, then there's you. But just culturally, there we don't have nude beaches in America. That's not a thing. OK, mm -hmm. there are other places where 
wholly acceptable nobody cares not not even new beaches uh when i was living in germany you'd go to the public pool sometimes and it's just whoop, it's all hanging out because whatever um but that that's 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 a cultural that is a subjective you know thing versus the you know guilt we think of in terms of a court case and that's a definitive finding based on facts based on an objective view of things so there there is something stronger there and i I thought of an analogy while you were talking i was trying to think of something that doesn't have to do with these with these cultural mores you know as a as an easier way to illustrate this without getting hung up on the details so (laughs) i guess it was because of this we just had the super bowl and for some reason i thought of scott norwood the poor bills kicker uh, who who missed that field goal wide right by about two feet in the Bills versus Giants Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something you're going to feel shame over. You're going to feel ashamed that you you missed that, that you let your team down, that you let your fans down. But that's not something you should have any guilt over. OK, it was, you know, it, it, it was something that, that you didn't that you didn't do that you thought you could have and should have. Um, but, but ultimately it wasn't, you know, it wasn't all on you. It was a team effort. Um, you can have all these other explanations for why, yeah, you know, you're going to feel that, but, and then you can list all these other reasons as compared to say the black Sox scandal, the, uh, uh, the Chicago white Sox who in 1916, 17, something in there, uh, uh, took money to throw the world series okay that's not just crap i missed a field goal that i should have made that's i purposefully threw mm-hmm. the game for money mm-hmm. okay so, so so i think an easy way to say this is did i mess up or did i do something wrong actually your dad Kind of because, again, we talked a little bit about me transitioning from a very uh, messed up family life to Mm -hmm. kind of one year staying with your family, which, you know, was a completely different structure. It was structure for to begin with. I mean, that was already there. But I remember the first time I really got in trouble in that house. He said, what did he say? Was it. uh, It's the equivalent of did you mess up or did you you know, mm-hmm. is, is this malice or is this ignorance? I think he yeah. said something to that degree. And in his punishment, he said the first time I treat it like ignorance. And then after that, it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, not learning your lesson is still doing something wrong. Yeah. And uh, it was the ultimate uh, moral of the story. And I, I kind of was taken aback because normally that would have been a, a tooth knocked out or something, but, <laughs> <laughs> and uh I have lots of fake teeth people. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I think that was my introduction to this concept. And I just kind of circled back to it, you know, way later in life as I, as I learn, as I study more basically, but, but yeah, it's, I think it's an important concept because we have to cognitively separate those two to understand people because people are more affected by one or the other, or sometimes in between, you know, I always like to say I have no shame, but I do have shame. It's it's just not to the degree maybe uh, you do. You and, and it's, you know, your emphasis is on different things based mm-hmm. on your, based on your value criteria of what, how you rank things. Mm-hmm. And well, and, and I think in another important concept to kind of lead in with is shame is a limbic response and, and guilt is a cognitive response. And, and some people are going to say, oh, that, that's not true. That's not true because you should think about things you're shamed about. But no, shame is, is the initial emotion you feel when you're told you've done wrong versus guilt is the, the deep down inside feeling you get when you know you've done wrong. Now, again, sometimes these things are in this, most times these things are in the same direction when they make sense for actual pro-social behavior they go and they go in the same line, you know, uh, we'll just throw an easy example out there. I purposefully kill somebody. That is where, yes, society should shun me. 
and I should feel guilty about it and remorseful mm-hmm. about it. Otherwise, there's there's no hope for me, and the person's already dead, so society should punish me, in that in that in that sense. So an easy example to to kind of illustrate the point. They do go in line most times, but when we talk about things like uh, monogamy versus polyamory and stuff, well, sometimes the rules can be a little bit fuzzy because there are polygamous societies that do perfectly well for themselves. Uh, and so, so the, the, where the rules came from is where I start to, to kind of banter back a little bit. And sometimes I just play devil's advocate because I want mm. people to think, but yeah. Uh, or you want yourself to think it's, Oh yeah. It's, I want myself to think if, if I argue myself into a point, I might actually change my mind. Part, part of steel manning the, the other side is to uh, see see how correct your side is if it really is your side or if it's going to you know shift you in a different direction Mm -hmm. well and i think a lot of the a lot of the uh positions i take even in this argument came about because of uh, where i where i started on the the side of what is normally what we consider in the united states the societal norm Mm -hmm. and i saw a lot of things that actually surprised me and kind of shifted me more away from it Versus the other way around where everybody's like, oh, you just want to hear what you want to hear. Uh, like, well, no, I, w- I wanted to hear the other thing in the beginning. Uh, it's the same thing with the, uh, with the, 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 the Kaepernick and the, uh, the George Floyd issue and everything. My limbic system wanted me to believe that, that, that there was something great going on here that, that we needed to stop. Mm-hmm. But it was taking a step back to study it that said, oh, yeah, the facts don't quite align with that initial emotional response. Yeah. And so, so the emotional response wanted, wanted that to be true because it would give us something to fix. And I think that's where the, the, the states are as in general right now. A yeah. lot of people want something, that, want something out there that they can fix to solve that problem. The problem is we're, you know, how many 10 years into this social justice process really realistically becoming mainstream uh, I think if you if you start it with Trayvon Martin, then we're about eight years into this process, and still nobody's made clear what that boogeyman is, other than whiteness, right? Right. So, so that's where the disconnect happened: is the facts didn't go along with it. You know, we all wanted something out there to change. There, there hasn't been a whole lot come forward, other than little things that y- you talk about them, you're still considered on the other side of the aisle. Uh, yeah, uh, a good. Uh... A good analogy of that is the last time I had imaging done on my neck, I was my, my neck and my upper thoracic. I was hoping to see something, mm-hmm. right? Because I, I was hoping that something would pop up where the doctor could say, aha, okay, here we are. You've got, you know, this thing here, you've got a, you know, whatever, a bone spur we need to take care of, or you've mm-hmm. got this disc is badly herniated and we need to do something with that. Or Yeah. Even I, if it's something major, you want something there because it gives you something it, to solve. Exactly. It, yeah. it, it's an answer. Even if it's a, even if it's a painful solution, it's a solution, Mm -hmm. but instead what it was, was, well, there's some little stuff here. There's a little thing here. This could be contributing maybe this thing here. And so there's a lot of little things and it's like good news, bad news, you know, Mm -hmm. because those, all of those little things are so much more difficult to address. But I, I think the, the, the bigger problem with those little problems is they're so much less satisfying to address. Mm -hmm. and so psychologically um when it comes to you know uh making progress with chronic pain or something like that psychologically it's much harder if you don't have those markers that you can say boom we did this big thing and i feel so much better no it's we did this little thing and i feel incrementally better and now I've got to go do more work to do another little thing to feel incrementally better. So I, I have long thought that a big part of the modern civil rights movement is a psychological need for the younger generation to feel as important as the generation of the 60s and the 50s and 60s and that civil rights movement. They're looking well, for something big. They need something big to fill something psychologically that's missing within themselves. I think you're giving some people that don't deserve it the benefit of the doubt in this one, though. Well, I'm talking about the crowd. I'm talking about... Well, but that's always there. 
Well, that, that yeah. need to be helpful is always there. And there are people that are hijacking that system. So when I say limbic, that means the reactionary centers of your brain. It's your, it's the, the, the not as cognitive, now it communicates back and forth with the cognitive because we learn things from that system. Like uh, saw a snake, I jumped back. Yeah. I learned that jump back reaction from the limbic system and it saved my life. Right. Uh, but uh the bad people of the world throughout all of history it's not just right now throughout all of history that have convinced a crowd to go a certain way that we would deem evil mm. uh, go back to genghis khan the things he did were amazingly evil as he yeah. tore through asia and, and eastern europe uh but everybody was on board but they're masters of hijacking the limbic system we'll go back to a smaller scale. Think of that friend you have that gets laid whenever they want. They're masters of hijacking the other people's limbic system because that person steps back and thinks for a second. They're like, Oh, that guy's no good for me. Or that girl's no good for me. Look, look at the, mm -hmm. we call them red flags, right? Look mm -hmm. at all these red flags, but all of a sudden those red flags go away because they, they are masters of hijacking your limbic yeah. system. That's a, that's a good sake back to, where where we started here because what what yeah, you said I, I, about I purposefully tried to yeah, get it back on that track it, yeah. it, because what you said about shame and guilt earlier about you know um thinking through and learning your lesson so if you are one of the victims of having your limbic system uh hijacked okay well there's some shame there because you did something that if you were in your right mind so to speak you wouldn't have done okay now you need to recognize why you did it because we all we all have that friend who is that person but then we all have those friends who are on the other side as well and we're going mm -hmm. why did you fall for that again why did you do that again why are you here for the first fourth time saying why did i fall for this guy who's no good why am i you know being led around by the nose by this girl who's i, no know, I know the thumbnail meme i gotta look it up so i'm like yeah. i don't have it to pull up but it's the one it's the 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 why is the best person with relationship advice always single? And then it's got on the bottom coaches don't play. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth of it is you are yeah. out of that yeah. moment. You're not being hijacked. Yeah. You're the one that is looking from the outside in without that emotional cascade of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of chemicals. I got, uh, I always get this backwards there, right, right above my thumb there. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a pretty good book. Post -rom post romantic stress disorder. He's, He's a, a psychologist that, that works with relationships in the long run. He also works with addiction in a lot of ways mm -hmm. because they're similar. And uh, it, it actually goes very in depth into the chemicals in your brain that cause you not to think good and, uh, and, and how that hijacks your system. Create that thick candy shell around your brain. Yeah. And, and, and so think of that person that is just you, you you see them with who they're with or doing the things they're doing to be with that person and you're just like doing the jackie chan why they don't know either realistically and in some ways that's a good thing mm -hmm. in some ways that that that's very stress relieving that's very positive for your body but then when it when it goes outside to a point just like addiction you know you, you could have a certain amount of alcohol and be perfectly fine and actually reduce stress and everything. But then mm -hmm. you become an alcoholic and you're drinking all the time, then you start driving drunk and hurting people and causing harm. So, uh, so it, it is a good thing to a certain extent, but then we always, we see those people that, and some people are, are relationship addicts. Yeah. And, and they need that. But the problem with that is you only have that for a certain amount of time. Even if you're in the best relationship where uh, you're going to last forever, you don't have that high part of it. You don't have that right. honeymoon period for the rest of your life. You have to move on to the, that attachment period where it's completely different brain chemicals. And yeah, and I assume that's what I don't know the book, but I know the concept of I assume that's a lot of what he's talking about is you have to learn to go from if you want a real relationship, you have to learn to go from the highs of that limbic system of that romantic love to the companionship mm -hmm. that, that the comes agape love. afterwards. Mm -hmm. that, yes, that, that creates that lasting relationship, which uh, is actually one thing, you know, language is important. And I like to take a lesson from the Greeks here because they have four words for love. 
and they're very specific to the kinds of love that the first one we were talking about where you can't think well is eros mm-hmm. which we we've translated to erotic right right eros is that that first stage of love and it's a very specific thing they say you are in eros uh, in in their speech then there's the agape which is that long-term unconditional love right and then there's a, i can't remember the the word the other two words but one's for your family uh, it is the love you feel for family and then the other one was uh, the general love for everybody mm. for, for universal humanity so there's four separate words for that we're in english it's a scary word sometimes if you're in a relationship because yeah. if someone says it too yeah. early oh my god you know uh-huh. we, and we always associate it with the agape when realistically in those early stages you can't say that yet because you haven't gone through that transitionary process uh, the biggest advice I give young people now, because I train, you know, youth athletes and stuff, and they get, they fall in love all the time. And I'm like, and as they go into college and in that age group, I'm like, at least be in a relationship for two years before you get married. Because the ones that fell in love at first sight and got married early and survived the rest of their lives are the exception to the rule. Because once that first wave of chemicals wears off, you start seeing everything about that other person that's incompatible with you. And that's when you make your decision. Uh, you know, it, it, as you were talking, I just realized we, we do have an, a word for it. We just have put a negative connotation on it, which is lust. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I guess, yeah, that's where our language kind of messed up is because mm-hmm. Uh, it may, you, you blame it on Christianity. You can blame it on whatever. I think it was around before Christianity. Uh, we put we put a, a value on words versus meaning on words, mm-hmm. and, and I think those two things are separate. Where lust could be a good word. You you want to you. It's a good thing if you have if you maintain a lustful inclination towards your wife. Uh, mm-hmm. Even though you've been married for 19 years, that's a good thing. Uh, and, it, and, and if there wasn't that in the beginning, do you think it's mm-hmm. going to? You think it's going to be down there in the end? Mm-hmm. No. It, 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 you, if you were forcing that in the beginning, you're in for a long haul. It just needs to be paired with, married with, if you will, that uh, that companionship, that long term, that unconditional. Mm-hmm those things need to, it's not an either or those things need to go together um which is where i think a lot of the a lot of the disconnect is and i think where a lot of the stereotypical jokes about marriage and sex come from is i feel like people get into this kind of rut in a marriage or a long-term relationship where oh well it's supposed to be like this now that's just what happens you know it's, no it it doesn't have to be just what happens you know where uh okay well now all of a sudden you're just you're just pals mm-hmm. uh and you don't have much of a sex life that's well one of the things i hate and this this might draw some ire from some people because uh I, it's funny i, I actually get more uh, hate from the conservative side of the aisle on this statement than I do from the other side is uh, I hate the term wifely duty when it comes to sex, not because you should want me all the time, but to me, that's coercion. That's not consent. You have to do this because you're my wife. And that to me, that's non-consensual sex because you didn't want to do it. Well, I was going, I was going from the other direction because there's a problem on both sides because that's from your perspective. But then from her perspective, it's problematic because it. I want a happy marriage, so I do this in order to do that, just like and, saving for yeah, retirement and, kind of and, thing. Yeah, and you're and you're you're putting the expectation there. That's that's exactly what I was talking about about this idea that. Well, this is just what marriage is, is it's, you know, loveless or it's the merman dies or whatever. No, that you're you're putting yourself into that rut with this with this very concept of, you know, you're not supposed to be interested in sex anymore or in, interested as much. And so it's a wifely duty and and romance shouldn't be like doing the dishes. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But 
that that it's interesting that uh that you bring that up because uh, dr- uh driving back over over the weekend uh had an interesting conversation with with the wife uh about some of the stuff we talked about and it, it reminded me of uh something dennis prager said a while back that uh the leftists turned into something stupid because capital l leftists are insane um is he he does a or did a regular segment on his radio show uh, on on relationship advice because he's he's an older guy he's been married a very long time but also because as a as a scholar of the Torah he could also give from the from the biblical perspective of of you know uh, Christians or Jews looking for marriage advice and well this is this is from the biblical perspective as well. And I don't remember the exact question, but a woman had written in uh, asking to the effect of what do I do when um, my husband really wants sex? I'm not really in the mood. Mm -hmm. And what and what he said was basically, if you really love your husband and if he's really deserving of love, you will get in the mood. And of course, leftist idiots turned that into Dennis Prager says husbands can rape their wives because they're stupid. It, well, it, now we're getting into people's heads, but I think there is a, a big difference between I'm doing this because I have to, and I have to get in the mood mm-hmm. for him versus there, there's a, there's a, it's a, it seems like a subtle switch, but I, I guarantee you it lights up completely different centers of your brain Yeah, would be, I love my husband and maybe this act isn't my favorite thing to do, but I love seeing him happy. And that's my favorite thing to do. Mm-hmm. And switch this around because there are some sexless husbands too. It's more rare, but they're there. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, that also comes along with sometimes a physical unableness to do it, but we make pills for that now. Yep. Go to your doctor. You can even do a, a online consultation and get it anonymously. But it's you have to have that mentality of, I love seeing this person happy. Mm-hmm. And this thing that I'm, it's not my favorite th- thing to do still makes them happy. That's why some that's why some of these you know guys go shopping with their wives, even though they can't stand shopping with their wives or shopping in general. Uh, but it makes them happy to make their wife yep. happy. Right. So so that it's got to be done with that mentality. And I think we lose that because of societal norms. When you don't have a stigma surrounding it, then people start doing things because they want to do them for somebody. And again, this is back to shame and guilt. Guilt is you feel guilty when you're not making that person you want to make happy, happy. Mm -hmm. You feel shame when you're just not doing the thing that everybody thinks you should be doing, including that other person. So, so I think that's why it was an important topic. And I think that was a disconnect before. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think the, the ultimate answer to, am I doing this for the right reasons is more freedom in general. Now the problem comes when where, where's the check on that? Where's, where's the part of the slope that we don't want to go past. And I think that's where we start getting into our discussions, but continue on with your wife's thoughts because that you got me down some rabbit holes with some of your questions yes. in the last couple of days. Yeah. Uh, well, we should preface this, I think, because you were here last weekend yep. for the Super Bowl, And I took you to a party that was mm-hmm. probably different than a party you normally would have gone to. Well, certainly not one, not, not the kind of thing I've been to since I was in college. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I got it. It was explain. very much like a frat party. It was very much like a frat party, but uh, young professionals mm. uh, or established people. And uh, there's a difference between what, again, societal stigma, right? Uh, we've stigmatized the word alpha male. Everybody thinks of that jackass, maybe Italian guy with slick back hair and an affliction shirt, right? When you hear alpha male, <laughs> it's the guy wanting to pick a fight with everybody. That's yep, what we consider yep. alpha male. That's not what an alpha male is. Right. An alpha male who is someone who is dominant. And when you're dominant and you know it, you don't have to be that other guy. Yeah. You, you just know it. You walk in the room and you're not threatened by everybody else. Well, this was, there was, there was only one beta male at this party. And that was the guy that showed up because he was invited by somebody else and nobody knew who he was <laughs> that he was the only beta male at this party. And it was a different environment, right? Mm-hmm. So, so 
going forward, your wife had a lot of questions coming out of this and, and the uh, statements I've made in previous yeah. podcasts and in private too, about infidelity and about men versus women. And we talked tournament species versus uh, pair bonding species. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously we had a bend towards the tournament type in that, in, in that house at that time. Uh, and I think we needed to, because of her questions, we, it took, took us down some rabbit holes to identify and either support or reject misconceptions that are out there. Uh, and where did you want to start with that? Because I came across a lot of weird stuff, even stuff that yeah. surprised me. Well, uh, backing up a second to the, the Dennis Prager, uh, example is, um, as you were getting to, there are there are two sides to that coin, and that's something he's discussed before as well, which is, you know, use the example of going shopping. One of my thoughts was, I don't want to watch this stupid romantic comedy, but I'm going to sit down on the couch and cuddle with my wife and watch it because that makes her happy. That's what she mm -hmm. likes to do. If you if you don't have that communication, if you don't have that understanding, let me stop then... you there. Right. Let me stop you there, because there's an, another important concept. I do this mm -hmm. because I want to make you happy. But if if I want to get laid, so I'm the man, and this is where the responsibility, this is where Prager should have taken this mm. to, to cover his ass, really, because it's, it's the right thing, is I'm doing all these things, but that sitting down with my wife and cuddling with her while we watch this movie that I'm not that interested in is courtship, and courtship mm -hmm. leads to sex. It is yeah. the peacock with its with its bright feathers, right? It is doing the things you need to do to get to the thing you want to do. For men, foreplay is physical. Mm -hmm. For women, the foreplay started when you sat down on the couch to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. Because that's, to them, that's, that's the intimacy that they tend to crave. And it's the intimacy that builds to the physical intimacy. Whereas we just want to get right to it. Yeah. Uh, keep, remind me to stay on task later because I'm going to bring that party back mm -hmm. up because I know we wanted to talk the difference between after we talk infidelity, the difference between uh, tournament and, and pair bonding peoples, mm -hmm. because the, the difference in women is, is different than the difference in men. Uh, and we brought up the alpha males and everything. And I want to make a big disti distinction. I, I speak in favor of polyamory because it's freedom and i always speak in favor of freedom when it's when it does when when i can see a road that doesn't involve uh too much gaming of the system uh but i would because we have a long history of being able to think this out speak against polygamy and so we might have to go down that road <clears throat> later so uh, yeah, that's an interesting distinction um it's it's about violence in the end <laughs> so but putting a pin in that yeah put a pin in that so, so segue you'll, you'll oh yeah so task. um <clears throat> where where i was going was that if you if you don't have that openness if you don't have that disconnect and then uh plus the difference between men and women you had a statistic uh that that when we were talking uh, offline, not in our episode that we did while I was down there, uh, that made the wife go, hmm, uh, because you'd said that women uh, cheat on their partners more often because the, 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 con the conception is that men are the cheaters. Mm -hmm. But statistically, you said women cheat on their partners more than men in what, it, what was the Pair bonding societies. In pair bonding societies. So monogamous societies. Yeah. And and the first question she asked was, well, how did they get that data? Because if it's a poll and you ask a woman if she's cheated on her partner and she has cheated uh, emotionally and mentally, she will call that cheating, even if a man won't, even if there was nothing physical. So so her, her, her example was you have a fight with your, with your husband or your boyfriend and you go out mad and then, you know, you meet someone at a bar and you just, you know, you sit there and you talk for hours, you know, mm -hmm. and you, you get, you get 
intimate in your conversation, even if you're not, you know, talking physical intimacy, you get intimate in your conversation. A woman would generally consider that cheating on her husband, even if she then goes back to her, her own house after mm-hmm. the bar. So you, you, if you're asking in a poll and you ask that say, that man at the bar, have you cheated on your partner? He would have said no, because all he did was talk to this lady at the bar, but the lady would have said yes. I would acknowledge that that partly exists, mm-hmm. but what the data suggests, and let me share screen here. And now, this, is where, this is where it got really interesting to me <laughs> and okay, quite the uh, rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that probably exists, but there's also the concept that a female is more likely to self-justify things. Like I got drunk at a party and we didn't actually have sex. We just kind of fooled around a little bit. Yeah, I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mm-hmm. cheat on her where the guy might've been like, Oh, my dick was out. Uh, <laughs> I guess I did. Uh, can I count uh, that to my body count? Well, the general rule for everybody in the audience is, and this is not researched, but this is, this is just bro science here. <laughs> if a guy tells you his body count, it is uh, divided by three. If a girl tells you their body count multiply by three. And uh, this is actually in our shame and guilt conversation. And this is why I yeah. thought it fit here because it, in general, on the bell curves, women are more susceptible to shame and men are more susceptible to guilt, mm-hmm. re- irrespective of society, of where you grew up. Again, that shifts where you grew up, but in those societies, it's still the same movement in shift. Mm-hmm. Where women, women tend to be more concerned with what other people think versus men did I do something wrong? Uh, and so we get to what I found recently out of the new scientist here. Now, so the actual studies were behind the paywall, so I'm sorry about that, guys. But here's the article. Fake lie detector reveals women's sex lies. This was, oh, this is interesting. So, so what they did is they, uh, they, they asked some sexy questions, and they did it in three ways three ways with their subjects. They did it in a, in a, a, a survey that the people thought that their responses would be known to the proctors, mm-hmm. uh, even if they didn't know their names. Uh, and then in a survey, which was supposed to be anonymous. And then with a lie detector hooked up to them with the person interviewing them. And they found it actually evened out. So the, the women initially came in with their with their, uh, people might see my, my paper with a very low number. People might not see my, my paper with a little bit higher number, but then, oops, when, when I could be caught in a lie. Yeah, about almost this, doubled from the first one. Almost doubled from the first one, where guys was just a slight difference <laughs> between the two. So, oops. So if you look out there and you see data, oh, women cheat. 17% of the time, I think was the number guys, 23% see guys are worse. Bump those numbers up a little bit because they're all survey studies. Mm-hmm. And when they tested how accurate the surveys were, we, we had a little bit of a discrepancy there between men and women. Yeah. So uh, now this, this is where it gets a little deeper into that is what a pair bonding society does is it kind of creates a, a mating hierarchy to some degree in a different way than it does in a polygamous society, right? So, and again, we're talking polygamy, not po- polyamory right here. Mm-hmm. So, so this is actual structural marriage or, or, or lifetime mating habits, right? So male A, top of, the, top of the group, alpha male A, male B, in a polygamous society, Male A gets top whatever percentage of women. Male B gets number 50 and bo- below to his choice, however many they're, they're doing, right? So we'll say it's 50. You know, a guy can handle 50 girls. A gets 50 girls. B starts at 51 when it comes to preference. Where in a, in a monogamous society, the, was, and the difference between A and B is only that little bit of difference, right? So, so big difference in female selection tiny difference in the male selection between those right whereas in a monogamous society a gets a b gets b c gets c 
D gets D and there's very little difference between the resource uh, allocation. If you, if you were to count having sexy time as a resource, right? Uh, so that because of differences and preferences and stuff that allows the beta males to kind of end up on an equal footing as the alpha males to some degree, because one is one, two is two, three is three, four, four, all the way down. Uh, then add other factors into it. What's important in societies? Well, make money, right? Mm -hmm. You can be a completely useless beta male and come from money in our society and end up with way above your rank in female yes. when it comes to a selection standpoint. Well, now you've got an unsatisfied female because she got this thing she thought she needed for security, but she also needs these other things because we got chemicals in our body. Mm -hmm. And so, so now we're creating a different situation. So, so that is probably the, the leaning in the direction of, of why it happens more in a, a monogamous society than a poly polygamous society because women date across and up. Women don't tend to date down. And you can, you can say across and up in, in any arena, whether that's, if it's a female that uh, puts a lot of stock in athleticism or money or whatever, uh, education, you know, a master's degree gets you 90% more swipe rights than a, than a bachelor's degree on a, a, a dating app. So guys, there's your hack right there. Tell them you get a master's degree. Uh, but it also creates a bigger gap between male A and male. And, and then at, at, at some point you run out of females, right? So now you've got a bunch of incels and that's always going to create a violent situation. That's why I'm against polygamy because polygamy creates incels. Well, it, for those that all, don't know what an incel is involuntarily celibate. Yeah. Male. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there's, there was also another statistic that ties into the um, women sheet more statistic because it's in a uh, dating system, if you will. What was this? Ten percent of the guys get ninety percent of the girls, or something mm -hmm. like that. It's probably even more skewed, but yeah, yeah. it's it's a, it's a, it's kind of a Pareto dis distribution, you know. Right. Twenty percent of the men, you know, twenty percent of the people make eighty percent of the money, right? Same so, thing. Every resource yes. kind of follows that same trend, and if you treat sex mm -hmm. as a resource. And then when you look at it from a sexuality standpoint, whether it's uh, in or outside of marriage or just in the dating world or, or you know, a bunch of singles in a bar, 10% of the men get 90% of the women. You, that's, that's the dating app trend right now. There are, mm -hmm. there are a bunch of male apps that never get a swipe right. But all the, the females are in control of sex. We know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so dating apps actually furthered the gap between the alpha and beta males. And, and that, that can be long-term, that can be a problem. Uh, but when we're, we stick to the subject at hand, infidelity, it's typically in a monogamous society, a woman married a man for another reason other than attractiveness. And eventually that gets to you, especially if you're a woman that needs validation, because now you're trying to see where you stand in the dating world too. Uh, and, and again, it's all the, the, the numbers I came across it, even if you add the lying and everything, it comes out, oh, it's about even it's just for different reasons. You know, a guy is, oh, I, I think I got one for that. Hold on. Yeah, here we go. Again, sorry for doing these out of articles, but first of all, they make it nice and uh, clear versus reading the studies. But a lot of the studies were behind paywalls. Yeah. And, but even when they're not, you tend to have to translate them into normal person talk. Yeah. But reasons for cheating men versus women. And they actually broke it down European versus American. Right. So women, the, the top one is my partner stopped paying attention to me. Where number one for the guy was the other person was really hot. <laughs> right. That sums it up nicely. People were hitting on me for guys. So Again, it's a very on the spot limbic response. Mm -hmm. Female, the other person was there for me, but you talked about emotional relationships. It started there, right? Uh, I was having doubts about my relationship, which would bring me to another article I have here. So I'm going to just keep my screen up. If those reading my tabs would probably see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And then finally we get to fourth reason. The other person was really hot. Mm -hmm. Well, it probably started here and they went out looking for a hot person. And now we got dating apps. Guess what? I can just Mm -hmm. hot swipe, right? Boom. And then I was bored. And again, we get back to suburbia and we talk about the, you know, the, the dynamics there. Well, a lot of time these women spend all day home alone because they, they wanted to be a stay at home mom. And then kid went to school. Well, guess what? I got between eight and four where I ain't doing shit. Yeah. Except things that I make myself busy with, you know, first world problems, right? I'm busy all the time. Well, I kind of did those things on purpose, right? Uh, so number four with, with uh, American men, my partner and I weren't having sex. Well, kind of important because especially for a guy, it's not going to take too long before you got to put your thing in something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, well, and, and it's 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 how we get validation versus how women get validation. Well, and we'll go into the chemicals here in a second because uh, we can talk about the different uh, the different highs you get from sex depending on uh-huh. if you're in a long term relationship versus a short term relationship. Uh, let's see, I was having doubts about my relationship, so already thinking about you know going out uh-huh. the door. Uh, the first two were limbic the 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 second two were more of a long-term process Mm -hmm. Uh, and then it finally gets down to my partner stop paying attention to me period right so that's a that's so look at the females and the males number one actually corresponds with number five yeah because paying attention to we to to your partner would cure the boredom your partner is having right so those are actually very very well uh correlated uh european women i needed to feel sexy that's right there with paying attention to me yeah if you're courting your your significant other they will feel sexy right uh and then if you're not then the first person that comes along and has a little depth to them or is attractive and makes them feel sexy well, it's going to start a little process going in their brain and they're going to start having their own doubts. Even if it didn't happen that one time, it's more likely to happen the next time they're in that situation. Uh, so <clears throat> the difference between men and women. Now, what I came across here was women who are married to men with larger penises tend to be more unfaithful. <laughs> that is the exact opposite of what any man would assume. <laughs> well, what it came down to was... We go back to our, oh, don't, don't cover that. What it came down to when we go back to these is I was having doubts about my relationship. Women that are married to men with larger penises assume more often that that partner is cheating ah. as well. <laughs> uh, Again, we get back to something that we have griped about repeatedly in these talks is communication. Mm-hmm. So you're just assuming what's going on here with your partner and that's leading you to justify your own bad actions mm-hmm. um i had a th- several thoughts there while you were going ah yes so that that really circles right back to where we kind of started before you got into these articles because if you are paying attention to your partner then you don't get down this road i mean you talk about alpha versus beta males and again i think it's important to state you're not an alpha male if you're a gym bro walking around in an affliction shirt and a whole Mm -hmm. bottle of cologne looking to get in a fight and thinking you're god's gift to women that's not what that means that's actually a good sign you're a beta trying to move up the ladder if you Honestly, all you really need ultimately to be an alpha is to be an alpha to your partner. Mm-hmm. Pay attention to your partner. Take care take care of and protect your partner. Give them attention. And that solves a lot of those problems. On the flip side, yes, we are almost always horny because we are men. However, you can get physically and mentally wore out and that will dull your sex drive mm-hmm. you know it's always there spinning oh, in the back of your mind the the stress hormones that are released cortisol glucocorticoids will will jack your sex drive yes. up your and, libido and, up and you 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 were talking about the 
the stay at home mom who uh, who married for tangible financial reasons and now she's bored. Well, so she's at home from eight to four while the kids are gone. She's home alone and bored. And then her husband finally gets home late and he's worn out. He doesn't have the mental mental or physical energy to give her what she wants Mm -hmm. because he was doing all of these things that she also wanted Mm -hmm. to, to provide the the life and the lifestyle that she wanted. Well, we'll we'll add to this a little bit of modernness. Uh, You know, more women are working too. mm -hmm. So they're both wore out. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, even if you've got a fun job or a great job, you know, sometimes it gets monotonous. So we still got that boredom uh, section. And you still, you still, women still crave that connection, that companionship with their partner. Well, that one I brought up with the, uh, the one I brought up, I think it was the, uh, the, the lying one. Uh, They also did reasons why people were unfaithful in one of those studies. And for a lot of women, adjacency was a big thing. So we also got a working woman world now. Mm-hmm. And that was the number one place to be adjacent to the partner they they picked up on the side was yep. the workplace. Uh, and it, it, again, you got boredom. You've got spending all day with somebody who might be paying a little bit more attention to you. And then you go home worn out. Your husband comes home worn out. Uh, and he probably was spending all day with people while, while he was not in a state where he was worn out. Yep. And you were not in a state where you were worn out with the potential future partner. And so it's, it's kind of a cascading snowball down the road. It, and, you know, I, there is a fine line here. So I want to be careful how I say this, uh, because this this goes back to kind of where we started with with Prager's comment is. In a lot of ways, because of these. Uh, stresses of life that are on us, you kind of have to force yourself in the same way that you have to force yourself to go to the gym because I don't want to work out. I'm tired. I'm sore. I'm whatever, but you have to know that you have to make it a habit. If you want to be physically healthy, if you want to be emotionally healthy, you have to make time with your partner, a habit. And so to Prager's point, that might mean sometimes you have to kind of do a little extra mental work to get yourself in the mood. So from the, from the, the female side, yeah, we're pretty much always horny. It's there in the back of our minds because we're men, but we may be physically and, and mentally exhausted. So you may have to do something to get that spark going. But then once you get the spark going, your man's going to pay attention to you. And, you know, like you talked about from the male's perspective, if you want her to get that, give you that spark, if you want her to give you that physical attention, you need to make it a habit of doing those things that maybe you don't want to do, but that yeah, I was, I was going to save you, but you just connected. saved yourself. Okay. Yeah. I was going to save you, but you just saved yourself. Uh, and that's the key. The difference between the workout analogy and why it's a false dichotomy is there's another person involved. Yeah. And yeah. so you have to, on your end, make the habit of making that other or not making uh, use that word loosely helping yes. that other person be more wanting of that situation as well so again consent it it, it takes it it has to be there uh in fact my only rule for sexuality is consent mm-hmm. realistically uh and that's where we get into kids because they're not able to have consent. But yes. uh, so, so don't, don't take me down. Don't put me in that crowd uh, yeah. for that reason. Cause kids cannot, cannot consent to something that they have I mean, no idea about. You're not, not you're not hip for. with the new trend of minor attracted person. I am not hip with the new trend of minor attracted person. Oh, okay. the, the only thing is I would, I would debate with people and actually I would, I, both sides would hate me on the debate of what age mm-hmm. is right. Uh, because my answer is it depends. I've seen some really mature 17 year olds and some 20 year olds that have no business doing something that can put you in an 18 year, uh, parenthood situation Mm -hmm. or longer. So that age of consent, you have to draw a line somewhere. But again, I've seen people that were ready at 17 and I've seen people at 30 that were not, that you just should just go ahead and get cut. Uh, 
It, <laughs> You don't you, you you don't you don't need to be putting yourself into the gene pool because you, you can't handle your own self. But awkward segue, speaking of parents and children, um I had this thought of when we were talking about or what you said, helping your partner. I think that's a better word of, of making your partner get in the mood or making yourself get in the mood, is um I think probably one of the the most important single thing you you might be able to do for yourself and your family is have an early set bedtime that you stick to if you have children because not only is that going to be better for the kids but then it gives you that alone time that you don't have because that's part of our that's part of our real life mental and physical stresses is we're at work all day and then we come home and we've got to deal with kids okay and now we're dragging ourselves into bed and it's like uh, you want to, you want to, eh, whatever, let's just watch a little TV and fall asleep. Okay. And then, and then you get into those ruts and, and you get into those, ex- that cascade of excuses that, that we looked at is because you didn't set aside the time and make it a habit that, you know, in this block of time, after the kids go to bed and before we go to sleep, we have this time to ourselves for whatever that may be. Well, that's a dynamic that um you know, because I didn't live in earlier times, I can't really speak to, but it seems like a modern phenomenon is that balance between, you know, we, we, we throw out the fun word spontaneity, right? Mm-hmm. Where that's the, that's the key to keeping you excited, right? But we also live in a dynamic world, world where everybody's got schedules and so many things can get in the way where it might be a good spontaneous time for me, but I could really inconvenience my partner. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't think they're going, Oh, now God in their head. And then you take that personally. I mean, you're just cascading down this. So, so there, there's, yeah, there's a yeah. balance between, you know, we probably should kind of schedule something, but also trying to read the moment where it's, yes, it's spontaneous for me, but is it also a good spontaneous time for that person yeah. as well? It, and I do think that is something that is an, an overwrought, uh, overused idea of, well, you need to spice things up. You need, but no, not everything has to be edible underwear and hot, hot wax. Okay. It's some, sometimes just being there together and having good old fashioned vanilla sex is plenty fun. And just what you need to kind of reset yourself mentally. Well, let's get the chemistry out of the way and then we'll go down the, Mm -hmm. probably our differences on that. Uh, So when you talk about sex with a partner, the short term, go out and, and do it, pick up somebody one night stand type sex for the male, for the male, somewhat for the female, depending on what she was looking for at the time. Okay. So say both partners are looking for the same thing. So, mm-hmm. so then, then you can say both partners are getting the same thing that gives you an extreme uh, testosterone hit, you know, and testosterone enhances everything in your body. So the misconception about testosterone is all about muscles. No, it enhances everything in your body. So any good thing going on in your body gets enhanced, right? So you get that short-term dopamine hit and that testosterone hit, uh, and that's it. And it goes away, right? You know, almost immediately, you know, a day or two, maybe. Uh Uh, So you get that short-term high. And again, when we talk addiction, those short-term highs become needing more and more and more and more and more and more, right? So when you talk about pair, pair bonding, so you've gotten to that agape state and you, 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 make, you make love or you do something with your partner physical, it could even be just cuddling, even a hug does this, is you get that oxytocin hit, right? Oxytocin and vasopressin. And that's a long, longer simmering. It's kind of a, like, like the first one's like a chainsaw and the second one's like a diesel engine, right? Uh, and you get this positive feeling for a long period of time and it's actually very great for you mentally, right? Uh, if it happens again, when you want it, when you wanted to do something. So wh- how, your mindset going into it changes this, but we're, we're assuming both partners wanted the same thing, all right? The best response you get is when it's crazy, wild, newish, and emotionally attached, because then you get the best of both worlds you get that dopamine hit, you get that uh, oxytocin hit, you get that vasopressin hit, you get that testosterone hit. 
So if you're making love to somebody you care about deeply and it's still amazing, you get the best of all worlds. So the best sex is with a partner you are emotionally attached to. Uh, so your one night standers, that's why they end up in a rut. Your, uh, we do it if we have to, that's why they end up in a rut. So how do you find that, that, that happy place, right? And I think that's where. Well, my point was, and I actually think this ties into one of the things we were listening to over the weekend. Schmachtenberger, is that the guy's name? Schmachtenberger, yeah. One, um, of the, one of the most amazing minds in the world. And sometimes he just doesn't come out clear. But yeah, he, he, you, could, you could tell he speaks carefully because sometimes he just goes silent. Yeah, yeah. And then he says a word. He, he's like Peterson in that way, but I think Peterson is, is, even though he's way up there, Peterson's a little better at making himself understood to normal people. Mm-hmm. Schmachtenberger made me think about what he was saying a lot more um, and, and kind of go down a lot of mental rabbit holes. Anyway, um, because he, he was talking about the, the fakeness of social media and what that does to your brain mm-hmm. when you th- when you are getting these chemical hits um and you you think everyone else's life is better than yours because you're seeing this very curated doubly curated because it's curated by the person who's who's posting on social media and then it's curated by what a whatever mm-hmm. algorithm they're using for that social media platform to show these specific things to you so it's doubly curated and 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 my point with the good old-fashioned vanilla sex was that yes that's the you know swinging from swinging from the rafters for three hours and you know the room's a mess afterwards it's great but it it it's not always going to be that and it doesn't have to always be that in order for you to uh, get that mental and emotional fulfillment that helps you get through the crap of daily life and then eventually get to that next high. Mm -hmm. You know, not everything, not everything is going to be in a high. Not everything should be a high. And if, if you think that, um, God, what was I reading? Crap. I forgot who I was reading a couple weeks ago about this, about one of the big problems with younger generations is they're, they're, they're oversexed mentally and undersexed physically because they think all this crazy sex is going on out there and they're not having it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but those people aren't really either. Well, and that gets back to that alpha beta thing is Mm -hmm. that that actually is the case. For a lot of people, some of those people you're talking about are on the dating apps. They are oh, sure, sure. They they are going out to the bars, but someone like you know my friend who hosted the party. Every time he walks in that bar, he's got someone coming home with him. But the other person walks into that bar and watches him take someone home. Uh, so that again, that's why I, I I brought up the the violence at the end of it. When you have, you know, ten percent of the males having 90 percent of the sex we're that furthering of the gap is going going to create violence because the the reaction to lack of sex is an aggressive response realistically and and 100 beta males will kill an alpha male right it's uh it's just the way it ends up in in fact we go back to a way earlier conversation i actually have a feeling that's why china turns a blind eye to the sex trade Hmm. the sex slave trade because these poor South Korea or excuse me, North Korean women are satisfying that large group of young men that they need to keep under control. Yeah. Because their demographics are way skewed because mm-hmm. there uh, are just more men than women. So even if you're in a more. monogamous society, there's still men left out, but they can go pay a couple bucks and, you know, take, take, uh, take care of that. And I think that's why China turns the blind eye to it. I don't think it's a malicious thing. I think it's a things would actually be worse for us thing. Now it's still wrong and it's still horrible uh, for those young women, 
but when you talk about how can I justify this in my head, I, if I'm going to put the most positive motive I can on these people, that would be it. It's still not a positive motive, but it's the no. most positive motive. Yeah. Uh, but- it's, it's, it's extra gross and creepy when you consider how often China brings up Japan doing that during World War II as one of their justifications for continued animosity towards Japan. Japan called them comfort women. Uh, and they were basically sex slaves that were, you know, locked up in, you know, rape warehouses mm-hmm. where they would take care of the frontline troops. Well, this just became quite the downer. Well, yeah, I'm thinking of, because I have, I have some thoughts on that. And it gets it goes along the the race discussion as well with the murray talks and everything mm-hmm. and this might be bannable yeah. so let's go back to our party so let's look at the mm-hmm. group of males that were there again I, I referred to them as alpha but they're alpha in a lot of ways yeah. they were all athletes uh they're all still athletes even though they're mostly most of them were retired but they they, they play in the amateur leagues and everything and they they know their status in society but they also all have good jobs uh, the ones that have kids still take care of their children. Uh, there, there was all of these ways that they were ahead of their peers, right? Now, imagine being in a society where the alpha is praised, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to hip-hop society. So even Colin Kaepernick says this is, this is our culture, right, mm-hmm. with his Allen Iverson talk. Imagine being in that, that status, that hierarchical group, which you're told is what is cool, what is good, what is everything, but you're a beta male. What's going to be your response? Mm-hmm. You're going to ultimately end up resorting to violence in some way, mm-hmm. shape, or form, or some improper activity, whether it's selling drugs or, or something along the side. You're going to try to force yourself into that by... Uh, ulterior means because you don't have the skills to do it the way those other people did yeah right? and so then now we've got a bump in crime and i think that the huge crime difference in certain places in certain cultures and this is this is not a black or white thing this is people that adhere to hip-hop culture or in and 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 the like is the response to these people that didn't have the skills to be an actual alpha male and again, it's a young man crisis. Yeah, these crimes are be- being committed by young men, not young women, and these young men are trying to get that resource that is the opposite sex. And we are more naturally aggressive. And, so, and the the more outside of the alpha loop you are, the more desperate and and the more you're willing to do to try to push your way into it. Yeah. And unfortunately for them, what they also don't get is females don't like that anyways. Yeah. You know, we can go back to baboons where the aggressor beta male is never groomed by the females, whereas the beta male that gets gets his ass kicked out of without provoking it does get some attention from the females. Mm -hmm. So it's a disconnect. You've got a whole group of of young males that that have to try to force their way into something. And I think that's where we we do have to address culture. Well, Um, because that's, the more we celebrate this thing, the more they're going to push into it. That's an interesting segue, and we're running out of time. So let's jump to some Wheel of Time, and that seems weird, but... Okay, so let's go ahead and close this one out so I can do it as a separate recording. Okay. That makes it easier because then I have to... Otherwise, I have to cut it, render it, yep. cut the other one, render it, and that, that takes hours for those that don't do video editing. Yeah. So let me just stop this one. So like, subscribe. I don't think we gave any medical advice here we oh, may just... have indirectly gave relationship advice so if you end up in a divorce because of us i'm sorry that's on uh, you bro that's on you bro you misunderstood something uh but uh i guess summarize there's a difference between guilt shame that's underlying in a lot of these things mm-hmm. Heath still supports complete monogamy i think polyamory settles the uh 
some of the, the, the issues that get in the way of long-term relationships. Mm. And we can get deeper into that later for those of you who think yeah, we need so to we'll, fight more. Yeah, we'll, we'll do another sexy time with Sam on that one. And we'll go into that strictly. We're going to go ahead and switch to Wheel of Time. Uh, anything else you want to add before I cut this off? Nope. All right. See you all next time.